today the Lord has blessed us maybe with the best weather in the world. What do you think? <laughs> today. Isn't that great? It is a joy to be here this morning and to see all of your bright, smiling faces. I want to remind you of a couple things. First of all, next Sunday afternoon, all of you senior saints, and you know who you are. And if you don't, if you wonder, then you are. It's pretty clear. We are inviting you to our home. It's the address is in the bulletin, so make sure you look there. Between 2 and 4 o'clock, it's come and go. You can come and stay the whole two hours. That's fine. I, I probably could even put you to work if you're, if you're willing. You know, maybe a little raking or something like that. No. But we'd love to have you come and spend a little time with us. We're going to have some hors d'oeuvres, little snacks and things of that nature. And just to, just to kind of get to know everybody a little better, show you where the preacher lives. And, and so that way you can stop in here and there and say hello. So we want to invite you to come be a part of that next Sunday afternoon from 2 to 4 o'clock. And let's just pray that we have the same weather as today. That would be great. But even more importantly, you need to think, well, let's go ahead and talk about the DeBerry meeting that's on the front of the, front of the bulletin as well. That's coming up in about a month from now. And you'll notice that the theme that we've chosen is Brother DeBerry is going to be speaking all about church growth and evangelism. And that's all in preparation for the event of all Waterford events, which is our Friends and Family Day coming up the second weekend in November. So please be thinking about that. And Brother DeBerry's going to come. He's going to share with us all day Saturday. We're going to have we're going to feed you barbecue. That's a little affair between Ron Englehart and his northern barbecue and somebody else in their southern barbecue. So we're going to see how that goes. Make sure you come and join us for that. And then, of course, that's all leading up to our first annual, we'll call it, Friends and Family Day, when we're going to have three services on Sunday morning, because we have on a, on, we, 13 times this year, we've had over 380 plus, our capacity in here is right around the 200, a little bit more mark, and so we, we can't, if we have... 100 or 150 or 200 visitors that day, which that's not out of the realm of possibility. If you're making your list, who's been making their list? I'll raise your hands. Come on, who's been making your list? Be making your list. Be thinking about it today. Friends, family, neighbors, co-workers, your barber. Barbers need Jesus too. You know, be thinking about who it is that you can invite and bring. We're going to have a great day. So that's all leading up to Friends and Family Day. Be thinking about that. Luke chapter 15. Luke 15 is probably one of the most well-known of all the parables of Jesus Christ. And it's positioned at the close of chapter 15, which is all about the theme, the concept of what it means to be lost. Well, when I say that word lost, what do you think of? I think of my car keys. I don't know about you, because they get lost all the time. And I'm always looking for them, searching for them. Some of you lose your cell phones. You might lose. I mean, when you lose something, it's a disconcerting feeling. Because you, you, you need it. And it's gone. And no matter how much you try to retrieve it back, until you find it, the anxiety builds the frustration mounts upon itself because there's a desperation that becomes a reality. Now, in this chapter, it talks about three different stories of things that are lost. There's the story of the lost sheep. And in this story, we see the sheep, he's lost and he knows it, but he doesn't know the way home. Now, interestingly enough, each one of these different groups represent lost people in our world. There are people out there who are lost. They may not fully understand what that means, but they know the emotions, the feeling of what it means to have a life they know is aimless and without purpose. And they know there must be something better, but they have no idea what it is. They have no idea where to go. They have no idea how to find God. They're lost and they know it. 
but they don't know the way home. And then there's a the story of the lost coin. The lost coin. He's lost, the coin is lost, and the coin has no consciousness. It doesn't know it's lost. But the woman who loses it, she still searches for it desperately, even though you know it won't make a difference to the coin one way or the other. And interestingly enough, there are people in our world that way as well. They don't have any idea that there's anything else. They don't have any idea that there's anything wrong with their life or their eternal destiny. But that shouldn't change in any way the desperation on the part of people who have been called to find them. And then we have the story of the lost son. Now this one's intriguing because it's a combination of the first two. The lost son is lost. He knows it. And he knows the way home. He simply has to choose it. And so you've got three different types or categories of lost people represented in parable form with three different profound stories. But one thing we have to take from this chapter is that the concept of being lost is a horrible thing. And I'll tell you, any of us who have children, we understand this because we've all had a scare at one time or another. We have one of our daughters, Reagan. You can tease her about it next time she's here. Reagan liked to hide in the middle of the clothes racks in the stores. Anybody have one that did that? Thought it was funny, 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 funny. Now, there are some jokes that are funny. This morning, Catherine texted me and said, Ron and I are running a little, we'll be there on time, but we're running just behind. Tell, tell folks it was about 8, 10, 8, 15. So I texted back, oh my goodness, you just woke me up, thanks. And then I let that just sit there for about 15 seconds just to see her reaction. And then I texted, just kidding. You know, that's funny. But what's not funny is when your kids in the middle of a big department store think it's funny to stand in the middle of those circle racks while mom's looking for them everywhere. Now, that's, that's a, a whooping galore that's a coming, right? Why? Because mom has anxiety. My parents, the worst I ever scared them, we were at Disney World. I was five years old, and they lost me. Imagine that at Disney World. Thank goodness I was wearing a Peter Pan hat that had a big old blue, red feather. You remember those big old red feather? And my dad actually climbed a light pole. I, I can't even imagine that. I can't imagine my dad having the ability to climb a light pole. But in desperation, he climbed a light pole and he scanned the crowd till he saw a feather working its way through. And then they beelined it and they found me and, and the anxiety, my folks still, they remember that day like it's yesterday. And there's a lot of days you don't remember, but you remember those times. Why? Because lostness is serious. When I was a kid, you'd buy milk in cartons and you had the milk carton kids. Anybody remember that? We're losing something now with these plastic milk jugs, right? Because they can't put kids' pictures on it anymore. And so every time you poured your cereal in the morning, you were reminded of how horrible of a thing it was to be lost. And that there was a mama and a daddy out there somewhere who this child means everything to. And all they want is to have them home. You see... To be lost. This parable tells us that God understands that same emotion because that's how he feels about an entire world of his children that are lost. And that he wants with all of his being to be found. So today we talk about what's been called, rightly so, the story of the prodigal son. But I, I like to call it the story of the prodigal father. Because you may not realize what the true definition of the word prodigal means. It can be applied in different contexts. 
Because the word means this. Recklessly extravagant. Luxuriant. Wasteful and lavish. R wastefully extravagant. Now that most certainly will describe the lost son. As he wastes his inheritance in a foreign land. In extravagant, extravagant debauchery. But if you take that word and apply it to the mercy and the love and the forgiveness of the Father. His actions are prodigal as well. Because his actions are from an extravagant love and desire that his son be found. That he be found. So we look over and we start in our text at verse 11. We're in Luke chapter 15, starting in verse 11. It says, And then it said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to the father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together. He journeyed to a far country, and there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. This is a boy who turned away from where he knew that he belonged. Now, the way that it worked under the Old Testament system is with two sons, the older son would receive the double portion. So if this father is well-to-do, which we would assume that he is, that he's got two sons. This is the younger of the two sons. So the natural way it would be divided is when a father dies, if he has ten sons, his inheritance would be divided into eleven portions. And the double portion would be given to the new patriarch of the family, which is the oldest son. So in this case, his fortune would be divided into thirds. And the one-third that would be given to the younger son... He requests it and requests it. Now, I don't believe that it likely happened that he asked his father once, Lord, Master, Father, give me what I was coming to me when you die and give it to me now, and it's given to him. I am sure this has been a long-term conversation. Don't you think? Where he's asked him and asked him and asked him and hounded his dad. Till finally his father relents and says, fine, go. His son takes all of that and with no remorse, no regret, he runs off to the big city and he spends his father's money living like he wants to live. And so he takes and he lives in this in this lifestyle of utter debauchery. He makes a conscious decision to go and notice that he takes all that he has. He takes it all. And he goes and this tells us something. At this point, this son has no intention of returning. He doesn't have any intention of going back. He is glad to be out of there. He is happy to be turning away from the life he's grown up in and living his own life in his own way. Now we understand this a little bit because all of us have been young. And there is some sense of a desire for utter independence in every young person. Now they don't all react in this way or take it to this extreme. But we've seen this in our lives, in our culture, in our circles We've seen this same spirit of wanting it to be my way, of wanting to determine my own destiny, be the master of my own ship. We see in the boy simply a burning desire to be independent of his father's rule. A desire to be his own man. He wanted to do things his own way. And I'll tell you, there is never a moment of decision that is more dangerous when that, than when that is the question at large. Am I going to do it my way? 
Am I going to do it the right way? Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 12 is a brief parable of profound wisdom. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but in the end it leads to death. And, and in that little nugget of wisdom, we see something profoundly true that is applicable in all of life is that when you ignore wisdom, when you ignore counsel of those who've walked the path before, when you ignore that which we're all tempted in our youth to ignore, which are those who say, you know, I've, I've walked this road before. I've been your age. I know what it's like. And we don't ever want to believe it. The young person who would just listen to the counsel of older people would have the most exceptional life. Wouldn't they? Unfortunately, most won't. But I'll tell you, that's the path to things like happiness and wealth and a life of, of security and purpose and meaning. But try to explain that to young people. Unfortunately, oftentimes they have to learn that the hard way. As did this young man. Because when we decide to go our own way, in the end, it often leads to destruction. We look over in passages like 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 18 through 20, where Paul will say, Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you seems to be wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. As it is written, he catches the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. You see, oftentimes, the real problem, spiritually in a person's life, is the idea that I'm my own master. I'm going to go my own way. Nobody tells me what to do. In the words of Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. That was the problem with the prodigal son. And that's what we see again and again and again. It's a refused dependence. An absolute rebellious spirit that says, I will not rely upon anyone for anything. You know, it really is a pride problem above all else. In 1983 and 1984, one of the most beautiful beaches in Southern California near San Diego is Imperial Beach. And it was shut down most of those two years. And the reason is Tijuana was having such problems that, that their waste disposal system was, well, it was about like you'd expect it to be in Tijuana. And it was pouring into the river and flowing down into the ocean. And all of that filth was washing up on the beautiful beaches of Southern California. So the city of San Diego and the state of California offered to the Mexican government and to Tijuana. They said, we'll come and fix it for you. You know, really, they had an ulterior motive. They wanted their beaches cleaned up. But we'll come and fix it for you. And the Mexican government refused. And then they said, well, you don't understand. We'll come and fix it for you for free. And they said, they refused. And then finally they said, well, you don't understand. We'll send our crack crews. We'll have it fixed in two days. And it won't cost you anything. And you'll have a new sewage system fixed up. And the Tijuana government said, why don't you just mind your own business and your own affairs and stay out of ours? Do you know that that story seems incredible, but there are so many people in our world who would rather live in their own filth than to accept help from anyone or anything. Haven't you seen it? That's the story of the prodigal son. This utter desire to be independent, rooted in pride, rooted in his own way, rooted in not wanting to have to yield to anyone or anything. We see it in his life. We see it repeated 
countlessly in our society in the lives of others. Which leads us to verses 14 through 16. As this plan that he's made out, this direction he's charted for his own life, suddenly turns in a wrong direction. But when he had spent all that he had, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. And then he went and he joined himself into the citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to sweet feed the swine. And he himself gladly would have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. Now you have to understand, this is a Jewish context. And swine, pigs, were the most unclean thing that a faithful Jew could conceive of. And so there's something powerful in the story with this imagery. That this young man who is raised obviously in a well-to-do, uh, a respected Jewish home, that now he's fallen so low that he's feeding the swine and what he's eating is less desirable than what they're eating. Message, he's lower than the pigs. He's lower than the pigs. And it's not because of any choice of his father. It's not because of any reasons in his background. It's because of the pig-headedness of his own rebelliousness. And so now, like Tijuana, he's been living in his own filth. And he's seeing exactly what his choices have resulted in in his life. So we see truly the prodigal son in these verses as his palace, as what he thought would be his great reward and his great desire suddenly becomes his prison. His palace becomes his prison. The great joy that he had suddenly becomes great, great sorrow. And isn't it that way? Isn't sin so deceptive in its allure? And then it turns around. You know, no one ever desires to be an addict. No one has ever taken the first drop or taken the first hit, or whatever it is that they take, they've never started down that road thinking, I can't wait to be an addict. No one ever does that. They always think, I can control this. I can be master. They never realize the reality of sin. And that is, and if you write nothing else down, this is, this is probably the most helpful to remember, and that is this. Sin will always do more in your life that you don't want than anything enjoyable it provides. It will always take you farther than you intended to go. It will always, it will always cost you more than you were willing to pay. And it will always keep you longer than you wanted to stay. Amen. Always. Because it is the great lie of the great liar. It's deceit. It always gives promises that are empty. It always says you can't control it. You can't get high. And it won't take you, it won't destroy your life. You can't take. Take that drink and the next drink and the next drink. And, and you won't be an alcoholic. You can just, just, you know, have this night together and there won't be any pregnancy or any problems or any diseases. It makes these promises. And it lies. It lies. It's lied to him and the realization is coming in. You see, some of you are dog lovers like myself. And I know a few of you have rescue dogs. Anybody have a rescue dog? That's great. That's a beautiful thing. When you take an animal that's been abandoned and, and you take it in and you love it. 
But I will give you a word of advice. You have to choose wisely your rescue dog if you choose to have one. Don't choose a pit bull that was formerly a fight dog. Now, I think that's awful that those dogs were subjected to that. But if you choose that animal and love it, no matter how much you love it, it's not going to be safe. You understand? It's the nature of what it's been through that eventually, eventually, it very well may turn. It's its nature now. You know, you, you can, I read about a guy who decided it would be a good idea to have a pet rattlesnake. Not a good idea. Because eventually, one thing's going to, eventually, it may not happen the first day, it may not happen the first month, it may not happen the first year, but you're going to get struck. You're going to get struck. That's its nature. The nature of sin is it is a vicious predator that no matter how soft it may look, no matter how docile it may seem, it has teeth. And someday, it's going to turn on you. Always. There are these we look and see how sin develops. James chapter 1, 14 through 15 says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desire. And when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. See, that's the progression of sin. Temptation, it, it makes all these promises. You believe them. You give in. Sin is born. And then after time, little by little by little, you trust that sin. You trust that sin. You trust that sin. You pet that sin. It seems soft. It seems kind. It seems to your benefit. But then one day, when sin has conceived, it brings forth death. You see, it's so subtle. The devil's so crafty. True story of some young boys in South Africa. They were villagers, they were hungry, they didn't have a lot to eat. And it would frustrate them because they'd go down to the river. And every day at the river there was this, all these ducks together who would, who would just sit out in, in the water. And as soon as the boys tried to get close, because they just dreamed of a duck meal, you know. And they'd try to get close and catch one, but they couldn't. The ducks were wary and they'd fly away. But then they noticed that Pieces of driftwood and other things would flow down the river in the current. And the ducks wouldn't even move. The, the wood would just bump against them. And then the ducks paid it. No, never mind. So these ingenious young boys, they came up with an idea. And they went upstream and they took pumpkins. And they put these pumpkins in the river. And the pumpkins would float down in the first couple days. The birds would see the pumpkins. They weren't used to that. And they'd, they'd scatter. But then after a day or two, they got used to the pumpkins. And the pumpkins would come and the birds would move a little bit and the pumpkins would flow. Between. Finally, after about a week, the pumpkins would come by and it'd just bump the birds and the birds would pay it. No, never mind. So these ingenious young boys, they hollowed out some pumpkins, made little slits for their eyes, submerged their body in the river with nothing but their head inside a pumpkin above the water line. Made their way down the river and sure enough, they were worked their way right up to birds. And as they bumped against the birds, they got up. You know, that's exactly how Satan works. Exactly. When this boy went to the far land for the first time, oh, he was just bumping against all these great things, wasn't he? Because Satan and sin, he was biding his time. For the right moment to get in. That's the nature of sin. Think of the level of humiliation. Swine, filth, the pig food. Sin eats away until there's nothing left. Because here's the thing. The scriptures tell us in Romans that, that though we were slaves of sin, 
We obeyed from that heart that form of teaching to which we were delivered. And having been set free from sin, we've become slaves of righteousness. He tells us that being in sin is, an, is a slavery. It's being enslaved. And the taskmaster is the devil. And he is a wicked taskmaster indeed. He's one who has the ultimate cruelty. I think of junior high school. And some of the cruelty that happens there when kids will sometimes act like they like someone and, 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 and others because they want to be liked and they want to be loved. They'll buy into that and it's all just really mocking and teasing until one day, you know, in cruelty, that's revealed. That's exact. I'm going to tell you, that's exactly how the devil works. He wants you to believe that he's going to make your life better. That your sin's going to make your life better. Until he can pull the rug out from under you and laugh. Laugh. Because he hates you. And he'll give you things for a while. So he can laugh at you later. He'll make you happy for a little bit. So he can pull the rug out from under you in your life. And that's what the prodigal son understands. Which leads us to verses 17 through 19. He finally makes a decision. He hits rock bottom, which is oftentimes where people have to go before they make the right decision. It says, when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like a hired servant. He makes two returns here. First of all, he makes a return to himself. He came to his senses, the text said. He took a step back and finally saw exactly how low he had sunk. And the bottom will sometimes do that to people. And I'll tell you, I know it's heartbreaking because we don't want to see anyone have to endure that. But the reality is, is that many folks, they have to get to the bottom before they can ever start making a change. That's just where some people have to be. That's where some people have to go. They have to hit rock bottom before there's any looking up, before there's any changing. And the second return that he makes is he returns to his father. Realizing what he deserves, he's now willing to take whatever it is he can get. He says, I'll go back and be a hired servant. I'll go back and be a slave. The slaves are better in my father's house than where I've gone. And notice here, there is an absolute, complete, and total contriteness a total brokenness that says I'm not going to defend my actions I'm not going to defend my ideas I'm not going to defend what I did I'm just going to admit I was a hundred percent wrong you know that's one thing that's so desperately needed in our society so desperately needed. Because today, there's so much shifting. Shifting of blame and of doubt. People say, well, this that happened in my life, I, it, I should have done that, but, you know, a certain so-and-so wouldn't have done this to me, or if I hadn't had this upbringing, or if I hadn't... And certainly there are terrible things that people have to deal with. But we all have a choice of how we respond to things in life. And for people to be able to say, my problems, many of my, not all of them, but many of my problems are my fault. That's the beginning point of a true change in a person's life. Which leads us to verses 20 through 24. And he arose and came to the father. 
and was still a great way off, the father saw him and his compassion, and he ran and he fell on his neck and he kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father said to him and to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and the ring and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this is my son who was dead, and he's alive again. He was lost, and he is found. And they began to be merry. Look at the father. While he's still a long way off. How many times do you think his father passed that road on his farm? And he looked down the road hoping. Just hoping. He lost so much. In the story of the lost sheep, 1% of the sheep is lost and the shepherd goes and finds it. 1% is bad. But in the story of the lost coin, 10% of the coins are lost and 10% is worse. But here, 50% of his sons are lost and that is unacceptable. So he yearns every day. 2 Peter 3, 9, God is not slack in his promises, not willing that anyone should perish but that all should come to repentance. And when the boy returns, he showers him with a robe, a scribe's garment of honor, with a ring, a signet ring of an heir, with the sandals, the shod feet of a son. Slaves were barefoot. Sons' feet were shod. Because that's the nature of the lavish, extravagantly wasteful mercy of a prodigal father. But when I think about our God and all the people in our world who sometimes know they're lost, sometimes don't, sometimes know the way back, sometimes don't, I know that we have a father who is looking down the road of this life, hoping. We're looking towards a time to be able to reach out and bring more in. So when we ask if you're making your list, that's an important thing. Because it gives people the opportunity to walk the road home this morning if there's a need in your life perhaps you're the one who needs to come home and you look at your life and it's been exactly as we've described sin has taken its toll and you're looking up from the bottom and you're saying there's got to be something better but here's the beautiful thing if you walk that road, your father is waiting and hoping that you'll come so he can receive you. If you need to come this morning, don't delay. Come right now as we stand and as we sing.